Park. And it's nice to be able to introduce Nancy Holt to a group of architects. I think um, we all have a lot to learn uh, from art, and uh, especially from the work of Nancy. Nancy has uh, always made it very difficult for herself. Uh, she has chosen to work outside of the mainstream, and that in itself is, is a position that uh, is lonely, is um, not noticed. A person working outside the mainstream uh, is not usually uh, featured in magazines, is not usually in all the group shows, in all the museums, is not usually on every chic collector's walls. And, um, and there's also, I think, a certain solitude in that stance. Nancy has also taken as her subject matter the universe. Uh, so those two things together, I think, make her um, unusual, but also very, very compelling and very interesting. And thinking about those architects that we know who work outside the mainstream and the problems they have had, for instance, uh, getting good jobs. Frank Gehry is just now starting to get good jobs. And how long have we all known about him? It's, it's a difficult place to be. But uh, Nancy has been doing some extraordinary work for many years. And um, I think we can all learn a lot from looking at the work. And there's many ways to look at it. I mean, first there's the poetry, which is there and is evident and is wonderful. And then there are the things that, as architects, we can learn from the work, such as sighting. There's a sweet inevitability about Nancy's sighting. You see a piece and you say, of course. I mean, it's just like it grew there, like it's the one perfect place for it. And there aren't many buildings that, that I know about that have that resonance of inevitability, which is something that I think we all desire. Nancy's use of materials is extraordinary. There's a piece that I saw recently in Bellingham, Washington, which is some concentric circles. Uh, the walls are about eight, ten feet high. They're made of this gray stone, great huge stones that have an iridescence that, I mean, you think you're in Stonehenge of the Western Hemisphere. And it has, they have arches and squares. And when you're in the piece, you know that it's going to line up in the summer solstice to look through. Somehow you know that that's there, but I think that that is secondary in importance to, to the actual being there, the fact that you're in this space which has total human scale. It's a comfortable, wonderful space to be. It connects you to, to the rest of the world, and, uh, and yet you feel very comfortable when you're there. And, um, and you know that the person that made it is quite extraordinary. And I would like to introduce my extraordinary friend, Nancy Holt. this working? Yeah. Well, I certainly hope I can live up to that introduction. Um, I think I would like to start right away showing some slides of my work. I've been uh, doing site-specific public art around the country for the last uh, uh, 17, 18 years, and I'd like to show you uh, a group of the works that I've done. So if we could uh, right away 
so I'll show a few. This is a work from 1972 called Views Through a Sand Dune. I was invited by uh, the University of Rhode Island to uh, make a work. And I had this idea for the sand dune piece, and I looked all over Rhode Island for the right dune. And this is at Narragansett Beach. Finding the right site is very important. This dune was right because it ran along the Narragansett River, which you see there. And it was always over your head for about a quarter of a mile or more. So you could hear the sound of the ocean, but you couldn't see the ocean on the other side. And then suddenly you came to this hole in the dune, which is five and a half feet long and eight inches in diameter. And when you looked through the dune, which you were pretty much compelled to do, um, you would see the ocean on the other side. And because of looking through this long tunnel, uh, the ocean seemed very surreal. And this is looking towards the ocean. I can't show you this uh, visual sensation in slides but because, of course, slides flat flatten the space. And so much of my work is about looking in depth and isolating uh, vision through uh, long, in-depth structures. But uh, the ocean really did seem surreal. And uh, people who knew nothing about art would, like the joggers on the beach or people in boats, would stop and go over and look through the hole. And this was some kind of rational act, but they weren't sure exactly what it was all about. It was a phenomena, and it made them question their perceptions. Uh, out of uh, that smaller work grew a much larger work called Sun Tunnels, which I began in 1973 and I finished in 1976. In order to make this work, uh, I had to find land and buy the land. I looked in New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah and finally found the right site in the, the Great Basin Desert in northwestern Utah. Uh, this desert was the correct place because it, it was very timeless. You could see where the, the Great Salt Lake had bitten into the mountains as it had gone down. And also it was a place that was pretty bare and had no other use. You know, it was a very saline kind of soil. You couldn't grow anything in it. So it uh, seemed an appropriate site. The tunnels are aligned to the rising and the setting of the sun on the solstices. And when that occurs, of course, the insides of the tunnels glow um, with light. Now, this is about the sun, but of course, it's also about other things. Uh, it's about tunnels. And I have been very interested in tunnels for a long time. The sensation of walking through a tunnel, what a tunnel means metaphorically, uh, a life or I mean, a death or a birth kind of uh, metaphor, or going from light to dark to light, a transition. Once again, this work is concerned with perception, as many of my early works were directly concerned with perception. When you see this work, you first see it from four miles away. And when you see something from that far away, you think it's large. As you're going towards it, you can see that, you know, the desert is such a vast place um, that the work tends to look small in the vastness. But as you get up into it, once again, it takes on a largeness. However, I'm not interested in, in building megalithic monuments that are going to dwarf mankind, but rather uh, spaces and places that are human in scale. The insides of these tunnels are uh, very cool during the day because of the thickness of the concrete. They offer a kind of cool oasis in the midst of the heat of the desert. It also retains the heat at night. And there's an echo inside. And the tops of the tunnels are holes that are cut in the different configurations of four different constellations, each hole varying in diameter according to the magnitude of the stars represented. And of course, the sun being a star shines through the holes. And so when you're walking through the tunnels, you're walking on starlight. And it sort of inverts the world. It, here you are in darkness when it's 
sunny out and the, you have this, the sky on the ground. And this I found I was doing over and over again in my works without being conscious of it. It's another work um, which is called Annual Ring, which I did in Saginaw, Michigan in 1980. This is a GSA commission for a federal building which is a solar energy building, actually one of the most uh, efficient uh, solar energy buildings in the country, and people come from all over to take a look at it. Most of the building is underground. The first, store, uh, first floor is above ground, and there was a little park made on top of it, which you can reach from stairway up from the street. The sculpture is visible as well from the street. As the light which you see cast, that circle of light that casts down on the ground, as that moves and fills the ring that's in the ground, when that fits perfectly in that ring, then it's the summer solstice at solar noon when the sun is at its highest point. The holes on the side are, frame the rising and setting of the sun on the equinoxes and the small hole frames the north star. In the back, you see the solar collector. So this really becomes a place of the sun, of contemplating the sun in all its aspects. Here's the circle of light moving into the circle in the ground. And this is it, the annual <laughs> ring. And uh, these are different views from the inside. Now, people will go here and eat their lunch inside and, uh, and use it as a public space. I usually take my photographs when nobody's around so you can see the structure and the, the sculpture itself, but I'm very interested in people uh, partaking of my uh, sculpture experience. This is the entrance to the work. This is a much smaller work, the small commission I did in Austin, Texas at the Laguna Gloria Museum. The, uh, once again, it's a, a sun-related work. And I was very affected by the architecture of this area. Of course, the stucco and the wrought iron. The museum itself was an old mansion made of stucco and wrought, wrought iron. The site was, of course, it's right next to the water, but nobody could get to the water. It was all full of brambles and stickers, so I cleared the site and placed the work there so that there was something for people to go to see. You know, like you put these works in remote locations to allow people really to, to see something, a, a place that they never, never normally would go to. It's sort of like a pilgrimage that needs to be made. As you can see that the wheel turns on its axis. And when the sun shines through the wheel and casts uh, the shadow pattern on the ground, that perfectly surrounds a core, a steel core that's in the ground, which you can perhaps see better here. On that steel core, it says April 5th, 2 o'clock, and that is the time and the hour that the shadow perfectly aligns. And that is the time when the work was completed. So it's a work that celebrates its own existence. Just by happenstance, it was my birthday. Once again, I'm interested in what you can see through the aperture. Um, many of my early works, which you will not see tonight, um, were about focusing in on certain things in the landscape or in the built uh, urban um, cityscape. Uh, here, I, I, by having the chain go across this body of water onto a larger pole, I'm trying to capture the mood of the place. Uh, Austin, Texas is full of lassitude and very languid. And uh, so I was hoping to, uh, with this, uh, capture that. Also, the, the water moves and breaks up the image, and then the image becomes clear again. And it's very hypnotic. This work, Elise uh, referred to this. It, it's at Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington. It's called Rock Rings. The outside diameter is 40 feet, the inside is 20, and it's 10 feet high. The walls are two feet thick, and it's made of 250-year-old um, schist, 250 million-year-old schist. 
the arches are aligned to the North Star. However, this work is not about the sun. I mean, in Bellingham, there's very little sun to uh, make a work about. So this is a rare occasion. <laughs> now, this seems like a very simple structure. However, uh, there's a certain uh, perceptual disorientation that takes place when you're inside. You don't see the work from up above like we've just seen it in these slides. You come upon it uh, at ground level, and you're not sure when you walk inside whether the wall of the inner circle is the same height as the wall of the outer circle. It's because of the curvilinear form. Um, we think so much in rectangles and squares, but when you start getting into this, the curves, uh, you're, you're into a whole new uh, ball game. So <clears throat> that was one thing that occurred. And another thing was that when you were inside and looked through holes and you wanted to go outside and look through the same he set of uh, holes, you often had trouble doing that. At least I, always, uh, while I was building it, I would get confused all the time. So it seemed to be a, like an innate perceptual uh, disorientation that was occurring. Now you can see that the stone masonry got very smooth around the circles and it was very rough otherwise. Now in order to build a work like this, I had to find exactly the right stone mason. I uh, looked around that area at all the different stonework and I found this really rough work with the um, inset mortar that really attracted me. And I found the mason and presented him with my idea, and he was very excited about doing the work. Uh, it took him three months alone with two hod carriers um, to do it, and it really was an opportunity for him to do something that would be appreciated in and of itself, you know, instead of something commercial or something in a, a fireplace in a private home. So it was his big moment, too, that when we had um, the opening for the work. In fact, he told me it was as important a day to him as his wedding day. So, and that has been true with most of my projects, that the people who work on them get very involved, that it's their opportunity, too, to express themselves. So in a way, all the works are collaborations. This is called 30 Below. I did this for the 1980 Winter Olympics in Lake Placid. I built the work in 79. And uh, it does get to be 30 below in Lake Placid. It's, this happens to be 30 feet high. And now the, uh, the earth is, of course, planted with wild grasses and flowers. I chose this particular site. And I had a lot of freedom in uh, the selection of site. Because there was a road, as you can see on the top, and then there was another road <coughs> coming in here at right angles. And so as you drove along, you could line up the apertures of, this, of the work and start to get involved with it and hopefully stop your car and walk over, which does happen. Inside, on uh, a day when there are clouds, there's a real sensation of uh, being, of, of the work being absolutely still, and that the world is passing by. It's like the still point of the turning world, to quote Eliot. Um, there is the sensation also that when you're looking at the sky, it's cinematic. And this happened in rock rings as well, that when you're looking through that kind of depth of space, that what you see on the other side is, um, takes on another aspect. So that people, when they would look through those holes in rock wings and see each other, would have to acknowledge each other one way or another, like wave or, you know, smile or do something. Um, but of course, these slides uh, take away the effect. Of course, bricks are very commonly used in New York State. They have a lot of brick kilns. And these were um, formed brick. I like to throw in a little process every so often because it all looks so easy, you know, like uh, when it's all finished, it's done, and you know, you forget about all the work. 
This is from 1974, uh, a work called Hydra's Head that I did it the first year that Art Park was open. It's a park where outdoor sculpture was made starting in 1974 until today. The river is the Niagara River, which at this point, which is seven miles from Niagara Falls, is very violent. It's very deep. It's about 30 feet deep. It's full of whirlpools. It's uh, treacherous. There's nothing uh, bucolic and lovely about it. It's, it's uh, a very dangerous uh, river. Uh, and next to that, I have these still pools of water. Now, fortunately, Hydra, of course, is the water serpent. Um, and so that um, I tried out a lot of constellations. I chose the constellation I did because of how it looked. And the literary uh, reference uh, sort of followed along. When you are looking down on it like this, um, you can watch little clouds go from pool to pool. You can see the moon uh, in the pools and the sun on a cloudy day. This is a small work I did at Wellesley College. It's called Wild Spot. I made this in 1979. And in the center of this work are um, 13 different kinds of uh, wildflowers, or per indigenous perennials. And they bloom from March through November and they're different colors and types and kinds. This is a, like a, a psychological work. You know, I was responding to Wellesley College and um, came up with this idea. I dedicated it to my mother, who always wanted me to go to Wellesley College. <laughs> <laughs> and here it is in the winter. Now, we're so used to seeing sculpture photographed, uh, you know, un under ideal circumstances, you know, beautiful sunny days. But I have always made permanent sculpture outdoors, and sculpture that I hope to last for quite a while. And one reason for this, I feel, is that I wanted to see it go through lots of natural processes, and go through the seasons, and change in time. And uh, so I think the work is valid no matter what the season. This work is called um, Star Cross. It's at Miami University in uh, Oxford, Ohio. I made this in 79-81. Uh, uh, it was fraught with uh, problems. There was very little money. Um, and lots of things had to be donated, time and labor. Partially, that I built this because uh, Frank Gehry, who they had an art and architecture week there, and they invited Frank Gehry and me. And then at the last minute, he didn't come. So uh, I had the opportunity of, uh, you know, having a little extra money uh, to uh, <laughs> his money as well. So that started a chain of events that led to uh, my doing this work there. Now, another uh, strange thing about this place, this Oxford, Ohio, is that um, it is one of the few places in the world where astronomical north and magnetic north are identical. So this work, the large tunnel goes east and west, and the small tunnel goes north and south. When you walk up the ramp and look through the small tunnel at the oval pool below, that pool becomes a perfect circle and perfectly fit, fits your field of vision. Once again, you're looking at the ground and you're seeing the sky and the tops of the trees, etc. So it's an inversion of the sky-ground relationship. This is also a part of Ohio where they have a lot of Indian mounds and a lot of rolling hills. and It's right near uh, Kentucky. So in a, in a way, it was a response to the place here we have, you can see the sky through the small tunnel. And that is the museum in the background, which was built by Walter Netsch in, in Chicago. And he saw plans for my sculpture, and he really liked my sculpture. And he actually gave some money towards the building of the piece. 
I always like to tell stories about, you know, a harmony between artists and architects. That doesn't happen all the time. Now, strangely enough, I was so absorbed in this site, and I, I never, you know, I was choosing where to put this piece for various reasons, uh, and I never once thought of looking out the museum to see how it would look from there, because I was always muddy and everything. I didn't want to mess up the museum. So I built the piece before I walked into the museum, and when I did, I was amazed to find that the window perfectly framed the work. And so they put a little see-through label on the window and t tells what the work is. So here I am, a, an artist that works outside of the museum context, getting the best of all possible world. I could never get a good shot of this, but this is, you can see the pool does become a circle. Inside, there's an echo. The tunnels are 20, it's 25 feet long, and people like to play instruments in there and get the echo effect. Here's the moon in the pool. This is an example of art improving on nature. Because I, <laughs> either art or photography, I'm not sure which. I'm gonna show you a few um, slides of how we built it, because it was such a struggle. Uh, we had, you know, very little money, and these are these pipes were seconds from a pipe company. The crane guy donated his time. Those are students helping me. I also had the architecture department, the en architectural engineers helping me, and they figured out the foundation, and and then they figured out these cradles. Now they never got an opportunity to ever build anything that they were drawing or thinking about. So this was like a very unique opportunity for them. So they built the um, false work for, you know, the concrete in their studio, and then found that they couldn't get it through the door. <laughs> <laughs> then they finally, you know, dismantled it and built it again out on the site. And then the, uh, the cradle here, the tall one was, of course, too tall for the concrete truck to pour the concrete in. So, uh, so it was a good experience for the students. <laughs> we had to build an earth ramp to go up to, the, to that arm there. Then I had earth moving equipment that only went up as about as high as you see it here. From this point on, I had the art students out there doing, building this mound in the old ancient Indian technique of pails of dirt being in a relay system, and then we would pat it down and um, chant. And we got, <laughs> finally we got it done, and it looked like this. And this was like in November of 79, and I left it. I thought, well, the earth will settle over the winter, and I'll come back in the spring, finish it up, which is what I did. We fixed it all up, and, uh-oh. Now we need to change the slides, I guess. Um, are we at the end of the slide tray? In that slide tray? Well, it's the wrong work, but uh, let's go to the other slide tray and then go back to this one, wherever that is. See, I brought uh, a slide tray that had 120 slides in it, and they got transferred to two other slide trays. And somehow got out of order. <clears throat> and then it looked like this. <laughs> so it was kind of discouraging, you know. Living in a little dank motel in Oxford, Ohio, you know, I, wherever I do a work, I actually am a, on the site all the time, so I live in these places. And uh, after living in this sleazy motel for weeks and weeks and then coming up with this, I, although I guess I knew that it would 
That was just a transition stage. Then we put in the pool. And in doing this, I got very interested in um, you know, the drainage system and, and the drains. I, I saw catalogs full of drains, and I chose just the one I wanted, which you don't see here. And then the piping out to a little brook to drain the pool. So in thinking about piping, et cetera, I uh, started doing uh, a whole series of works about basic technologies that we all live with and buy, uh, but we don't really own up to them, and they, we hide them away behind the walls. Architects hate to think about plumbing and electricity and all of that. But I started to think a lot about it, and this, this work is called um, Electrical System to Thomas Edison. And I did this in 1982 in New York. And it was exactly 100 years after Thomas Edison first strung all light bulbs together. So it absolutely is no technical advance over what Thomas Edison did. Uh, all I'm doing here really is um, making one more aware of uh, the electricity flowing through the system. And also, even though it's in an, in an interior space, you do think about where the electricity is coming from. It's coming from Con Ed, it's been transformed from another form of energy, and now it's going through the system. The system is also functional. The light that is being produced is lighting the gallery. You can walk in and around it. These structures have been made so that people can walk through them. And the sensation was, and most people relayed to me, was that they felt it was like a fountain of electricity, and they were very aware of the electricity going all around. You could turn the whole system on and off over there on the wall, that little rectangular area. This is a larger version that I did in Toronto at the David Bellman Gallery. It's called Bellman Circuit. And here, it was a much rougher space with other piping, so it sort of fit into the whole you know, more rough industrial look. The light bulbs are the kind that show the arc of electricity, which you don't see on these slides. It tends to blur the light. But, you know, you were conscious of the electricity. I did a work like this at the L.A. County Museum in January of 85. I forgot to bring slides of it, but maybe some of you saw the show about, it was public art show. It was called the artist as social designer. And four of us actually designed the space that the show was in. With money they would have spent anyway designing a show. And I did the lighting system, and uh, Scott Burton did the seating and book display, and Mary Miss did the entryway, and Ellen Zimmerman did the uh, slide projection seating. Now this is uh, a work that is called Catch Basin, and I did this in Toronto. It's in St. James Park in Toronto. Um, here we have a park that already existed, but then they took some buildings down and they extended the park. And in, in doing so, the landscape architects somehow messed up. And every time it rained, a big puddle of water would form right where the catch basin is. So I went there and I told them I would fix it for them, <laughs> which, which I did. And here, I'm, in dealing with a land drainage system, I'm dealing with a technology that's thousands of years old, like 5,000 years old. And there are systems still today in, in uh, Babylon and Crete that you know, still work that are irrigation systems. The earth here was so hard, it's a clay-like uh, compacted earth that it never, it doesn't absorb the water. So when it does rain, the water does collect in the um, channel pipe and it rushes in to the catch basin. As you can see, the structure over the catch basin exactly repeats the basin itself, but also it's an inversion of the uh, gazebo in the distance. Now, 
clay channel pipe was first used 500 years ago in uh, France, where they, when they first inverted the roof tiles and um, channeled the water. Here's the water going through. And I very carefully selected this tree grate. I'm very interested in using uh, building materials that already exist in the world and going through a careful selection process and using them the way they're supposed to be used as well. Like this is plumbing pipe used exactly the way plumbing pipe should be used. Uh, this is in Dublin, Ireland, and it's called Marley Park. Uh, well, the, the work is called Soul Source. It's in Marley Park. And Marley Park was an estate, a 17th century estate. And I was invited by the independent artists of Ireland to go there. They had very little money. They could pay my way over, and they hoped that I could do a small piece. Uh, I s went to this site, and I saw the haha -ha here. Now, haha -ha is an 18th century landscape or architecture device, which uh, kept the animals away from the main manor house, and yet you couldn't see it. If you're you know, a few hundred feet away, it just blends in with the lawn. So as you approach it, you see it, and it's a surprise, hence haha. -ha. Uh, so anyway, here was this 250-year-old pipe going from a man-made reservoir uh, to the manor house up to the second floor actually because the reservoir was higher than the manor house so that just through gravity they had a flow of water. So I tapped into this 250 year old pipe which had a valve on it, it was simple enough and brought the water up through this structure. Now the structure echoes the manor house in the distance. The uh, water can be turned on and off at the uh, valve. And here you have this elaborate system, and you have just these small trickles of water at the end. Well, they're not so, they're, they're substantial streams of water, but, um, but anyway, I like, you know, the intricacy of such a system leading to this. This is called hot water heat, and this is a functioning hot water heating system, which uh, heated the gallery, it's the John Weber Gallery. This is January of 1984. And um, once again, I'm using the plumbing pipe the way it's always used. Uh, the only difference here is that I did bend a couple of them. But in bending them, I bent them exactly the same way as they do the pigtails, the small pigtails that you see the gauges on. Here's one of, an example of that. Now, all the gauges worked. This one went up and down when you turn the system on and off at the valve. Uh, here's a radiator I got in Bedford Stuyvesant on uh, this little old shop that I cleaned up. And here's an inline thermometer. This is a thermohygrograph. You put a, gra a round graph in once a week, and you'd get a red line and a blue line showing the temperature and the humidity. So it's a sculpture that makes its own drawings. And this is a site flow indicator showing when the water was going through the system. You could touch the pipes, of course, they'd be hot. This is called water work. And uh, I did this at Gallaudet College in Washington, DC. It was completed in 1984. Gallaudet College is the largest school in the world for the deaf. And they start at nursery school and they go through graduate school. Where this site is, is very close to where the young children went to school. So I was very conscious of the sociology of this particular site. I wanted to make something that would have scale for the little ones as well as be for everybody. Uh, there are places here where the smaller children can sit along the low pipes. Uh, there are sand pits and there are places where you can turn the water, the, the gauges where you, valves where you can turn the water on and off, and they can bring the water into the sand pits, etc. Here you have the water coming completely through the system 
uh, starting you know, at a single source and splitting into two at the sandbox area and then going into the, the basin and splitting into three, becoming visible again in, in the channel pipe going into the smaller catch basin. Now, here you have a, like a vast regional network of pipes underground that I have brought up. Uh, it's just a part of this huge network and made it more visible, made one more conscious of it. And then when the water goes into the drainage system, it becomes part of the actually a very large universal cycle. It goes into the ocean, it evaporates, it goes into the reservoir, it goes into the piping system, and around and around again as part of the, the universe. Now, little kids haven't turned off their interest in uh, electricity and plumbing and things. They're really uh, very, uh, they ask a lot of questions and they want to know where the water goes and where it comes from how plumbing works, et cetera. This is another site flow indicator, and this proves that the water goes through the whole system. I could have cheated and just had it coming out the ends, you see. But this shows that it really goes through the system. Uh, this work is called Ventilation. I did this at the Temple Gallery in 1985 in Philadelphia. And each of those ventilators is turning at a different speed. And there are inline fans that are making them turn. Uh, this is a work I did at the Palladium in New York. It's Ventilation 2. And all the ventilators were spinning around. and. Uh, it's uh, 24 feet high. Now this is my park, Dark Star Park, that I made in Arlington, Virginia. And with this park, a lot of new ground was broken for public art. In 1979, uh, they called me and said, you have, you have the commission to a sculpture down here in Arlington. We want you to come and see the site. At that time, the site was just this uh, site portion that's on the bottom here. And it was an old parking lot where the asphalt was all upturned and cracked and there were old soda bottles and uh, weeds, etc. It was a real urban blight site. Well, I took a look at it and I said, well, they said, well, we're going to make a park here. We want you to put a sculpture in it. And I said, well, you know, what's the sense of doing that? Why don't you let me have the whole space to work with? I can become the landscape designer and the sculptor, and we'll have a sculpture that, that is a park. Well, fortunately, uh, Tom Parker, who was uh, with Arlington County, he was very open to this idea. Uh, his father had been the head of the WPA projects in the 30s, and uh, so he had some kind of an art background, although he was not, he was an engineer or a city planner, actually. Um, and then the NEA, which had given some money for the sculpture, they went along with this thinking, too. So I managed to get a contract to do the whole park. But I wasn't content with that. I saw that island up there, and I thought, well, this site's already it's a challenge, because we have these two huge roads. And this is, by the way, the entrance to Roslyn, which is um, the part of the uh, Arlington, that where all the high rises are going up, it's like one of the fastest growing cities in the United States because they can't build high rises in Washington D.C. So, and it's right across the Potomac from Washington, and you can see Arlington Cemetery is right. If this slide went a little further, you'd see Arlington Cemetery and the Iwo Jima Monument. Um, anyway, so here, this was like the entrance to Roslyn, which was like a concrete jungle. I mean, just. There were no parks, just these high uh, buildings, and it was a very cold and human place. So it was a challenge uh, already to uh, make a park in such a place, but at the same time, I was meeting a very 
deep need. And I was responding to that uh, very much. So anyway, I saw the island up there and I thought, well, I've got to have that too and I'll try to integrate these two pieces of land somehow. I went to Arlington County. They said, oh, forget it. It belongs to the state. You'll never get it. But I persisted and there were papers drawn up and letters and phone calls, et cetera. And finally we got the island from the state. But then I still wasn't, uh, there was still a few more battles to be fought. Um, I was told that a building was going to be built right next to my park, suddenly, you know, like somebody had bought the land and they were going to build an office building. I said, well, you know, this is going to really affect my park. And, you know, I, I'm going to have to have something to say about the architecture. So they said, okay, we'll put you on the committee to approve the architecture. Well, artists are never given any power in the world. I mean, this was like a shock, you know. We are never asked how the world should look. We're the last people that anyone ever thinks about. The architect might begrudgingly, you know, just designate a little place after the fact for a little, you know, work of art to be, but never our art artists are up until now, anyway, it's starting to happen. But at this time, in 1979, it was unheard of uh, that an artist would be brought in at the early stages. So the uh, architect, whose name is uh, Alex Jeffries, a Washington architect, um, came up with a plan for a building. And uh, his plan was going to take up the whole space and um, was going to cut off the view of the park from the main intersection of Roslyn. So nobody would know the park was there. Not only that, but the front door of the building, which was very large and prominent, was going right on, out onto the park, making the park look like a front yard for the building. So I mentioned these objections that I had to others, and uh, others seemed to agree with me that um, the building wasn't appropriate for the site and it was rejected, uh, much to the chagrin of the architect. Uh, so then he came up with this building here, which uh, resolved those two problems. And uh, so that was a good thing. And uh, <clears throat> the next thing was, though, that he had drawn a, a straight line. There was the plaza of the building, and here was the park. There was no correlation, no interrelation between the park and the building. And this really concerned me a great deal. So I went to, I knew I couldn't go to the architect. I went to the developer. I said, look, you could have a work of art flowing into the plaza of your building, surrounding some of the columns, and being part you know, of the presence of your building. Uh, and he's, and I, I, I said, I wanted to build a mound, and it would flow. And he said, oh, it's too avant-garde an idea. Uh, the mound might cut off the sun from his, this lower floor, and he wouldn't be able to rent the spaces. And he was very negative about it. Fortunately, just about that time, he hired a new manager who had studied with Peter Walker at Harvard. And at that time, Peter was the head of the landscape architecture department at Harvard. And Peter knew my work. and. So Peter said, you ought to listen to her. You know, you don't dismiss her like that. So we had a meeting. And Peter flew down from Boston, and I flew from New York. And Tom Parker from Arlington County was there. And the architect was there, and the developer. Um, by the way, this very day, a, a new issue of a magazine I had never heard of before called Building Stone Magazine had come out with an article about rock rings, which you saw before. And it happened to be one of the developer's favorite magazines. <laughs> so that was a real plus. Um, anyway, we had this meeting, and the architect, every 15 minutes, said, art has to be subservient to architecture. <laughs> um, fortunately, nobody listened to him. And uh, at the end, he said, well, you may be able to convince all these other people, but you'll never <laughs> convince me. <laughs> um, so, but I've heard that since then he goes around giving lectures about the beauty of berms flowing into <laughs> the plaza. So, uh, 
So um, anyway, this is, gives you an indication of what it might be like. I don't think this is, uh, see I also let their plaza flow out into the park. Now, as you can see, there are two sets of shadows here. And the long set, the grayer set, uh, is asphalt. And they're permanently in the ground. Uh, with Kodachrome slides, the uh, real shadows always turn out to be black, which they're not, of course. But Now, when those real shadows fill the uh, patterns on the ground perfectly, it is August 1st at 9.32 AM. Now, at that time, at that day, in 1860, William Henry Ross bought the land that became Roslyn. So this is a way of including historical time and the cyclical time of the sun and bringing them together in one place. And, um, and I think it's important for public art to uh, have a sense of history about the place, you know bring something of the place back into the work. When you uh, look through, there are two spheres that have holes. And uh, as you can see, when you look through this one, you see the one across the street. And uh, also, you see the curvilinear quality of the straight, uh, the straight poles casting curved lines on the spheres. This is the tunnel entrance to the park. It's a 25 foot long tunnel, 10 feet in diameter. And <clears throat> as you walk through, you see more and more of the park. Now, what happens as you drive by or walk by, there are different spheres that eclip eclipse other spheres. So there's always a sense of discovery as you walk around. Suddenly you see a hole in a sphere and you look through that. Or you, know, you see different relationships um, being set up. When I uh, thought through the park, I thought about the pedestrian traffic. I thought about the retaining walls being the right size and height for people to sit on. I thought about the uh, high buildings all around, the people looking down from the high buildings and wanting to see something um, you know, that made sense to them from up above. Here you see the pools of water. There are several things that happen with them. You can see the reflection of the sphere and the um, shadow of the sphere interacting there. And also, the water, when it ripples, the sunlight bounces off the water and flashes up on the bottom of the spheres. As you walk along, the, the berm there is uh, keeping you from seeing into the park. And it also is, by the way, cutting out the noise of the traffic and, and making a, a more con contemplative space there. Um, but then suddenly you see the small tunnel and with steps. And you walk up the steps, look through the tunnel. And what you see is the spear in the pool, which pretty much um, actually this slide was taken from somewhat inside the tunnel, but when you're at a certain point, it perfectly fills your field of vision. So it's like an eclipse. It's like a surprise at the end. This is the park being used, which it is used a lot. At lunchtime, uh, people are sitting there. And this is how it was made with gunite and a screed. And this is a very sculptural method, actually. You know, with the gunite, you, you don't form it up on both sides. You just form one side. And then they make handmade tools and um, form the rest of it. This work is called um, End of the Line West Rock. I did this at Southern Connecticut University in New Haven in 1985. They had built a building, a dormitory, which eclipsed the view, or not eclipsed, partially eclipsed the view of uh, West Rock, which is a famous landmark in New Haven. There it is in the, in the distance. You can see part of the dorm there. So what I did is I salvaged the only complete view, really, left of uh, West Rock and 
focused in on it. Now I guess we can go back to the other uh, slides. Now, see how different it looks from this side. You know, curvilinear forms are really amazing that way. Look one way from the inside and another way from the outside. Then these uh, boulders go from the piece across the parking lot. Uh, they act as ballards to uh, keep the cars from going down that tremendously steep hill there that goes straight down to the base of the dormitory. So it's a functional artwork. All of my works are functional, one way or another. And here you see the rocks blending into some uh, stone masonry retaining walls that were already in place. And then there were these three boulders I used for sitting. They were, they were strategically placed so you could see the whole work from the, this vantage point. this vantage point. I went up to Alaska this year in March for a week. Uh, they invited me to go up there and get, have ideas for what for works that I could come back and do in July. So when I went back in July, I, I had been most inspired by the Alaskan pipeline. So I did this work, which is called Pipeline. And as you can see, it traverses, um, there are three sections of it, two outdoor sections. This traverses the railroad tracks. And then there's a section that comes up forming an archway that you can walk through and then goes, snakes along the building. And then at the point where it goes in on the outside, it comes out on the inside. And when it gets down close to the floor, it drips oil. And this puddle of oil was in a false floor, and I, it was very delicately made, so that, and then it was painted white, so you really couldn't tell it was a concavity. And um, so the oil was dripping like every second or so and creating, you know, circles. And people were worried, you know, that very soon it was going to go up on the floor. So it created a kind of tension. But you have to remember that in Alaska now, you know, the oil, with the oil price is so deflated um, that it really is making a statement about, uh, well, several statements at once, of course, the ecological statement and also the state of the economy. This gallery was financed primarily by oil companies, and so it was a very subversive work, which I managed to uh, sneak in. Here's uh, also in Alaska, they had a, a sky art show and asked me to be part of it. So I took some of the pipe that I'd used for that, cut it, and uh, these put it in the ground in the configuration of the Big Dipper and the North Star, which is what is on their state flag and on all their licenses. And it's called Starfire. Now this could be a permanent work, um, and could you know fires could be put in it. Flag and on all their licenses, and it's called Starfire. Now this could be a permanent work, um, and could you know fires could be put in it special days or whatever. Now, this is my big piece that I'm doing right now. It's uh, called Sky Mound. It's a landfill in the New Jersey Meadowlands. And it's 57 acres, it's 100 feet high. It's four miles from the Holland Tunnel. From the top of it, you can see all of Manhattan. It's really an incredible view from the top. On one side is the New Jersey Turnpike. 
going right next to it. On the other side is Amtrak and New Jersey Transit going like from New York to Philadelphia and Washington, et cetera. And all the jets flying into Newark Airport fly right over it. So it's estimated that 125 million people a year will see this artwork. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really one of the most visible artworks ever made, I guess. Um, now, <clears throat> this is the first landfill to be closed in, in the area. They have $8 million worth of closure funds. Out of some of that money can go to make the art, as long as what I want to do fits within. I mean, if they have to move earth around, they might as well move it around the way I want it. If they have to make a drainage pond, they might as well make one that I want. So within that context of uh, you know, closure funds, I can do a certain amount of the artwork. So far, what's been done is that a ditch, a 30-foot ditch, has been made around the outside edge, and a slurry wall has been made, uh, mixing together clay and cement. It forms an impenetrable wall to keep the waste out of the groundwater, et cetera. Also, a leachate collection system has been put in uh, to collect that from the landfill, and a water drainage system, and a utility road. So that has taken a year and a half. It was supposed to be a six-month job, and they are still just finishing it up now. Um, but uh, it is state-of-the-art landfill closure. Once, once that is finished, then the top will be covered with clay, uh, with a foot of clay, which will keep all of the gases uh, and any impurities from getting out of the landfill. GSF Energy has bought the rights for the methane from the landfill, uh, like for $3 million. And I am working with them to design a methane recovery system which will be incorporated into the artwork. It, it's going to be an alternate energy source which will provide like maybe 10% of the local community's um, gas. I have this model. I have very good renderings that really show what the work is going to look like, but I don't have slides of the renderings. I have this one slide of the model, and I think it's very hard to read. I don't think you're going to get the whole picture, but I'll try to give you a general view of it. The center area with the radiating gravel lines going out is the sun area. And the radiating lines that go between 25-foot mounds are, uh, going in, you know, are framing the rising and the setting of the sun on the solstices and equinoxes. The sunrise on the equinox is actually happens over the Chrysler building, and as the sun rises, it sort of like gets pierced by the um, Empire State Building. Then, in the middle of the sun area, there's a structure that's going to cast a circle of light into a ring on the ground on the solstice at noon. The pond is, a, is actually a, a, a pond that is functional to collect the rainwater from the slope, uh, from the top. And beyond that are two mounds on the north-south line that are star mounds. There's going to be a, a tunnels that align with the, the star, star's setting. And these are Sirius and Vega, which are the bright, Vega is the brightest star in the summer sky, and Sirius is the brightest star. Uh, and then there are, are steps going up the mounds to little viewing platforms, uh, which will be at the angles of the rising of the stars. Further over, where you see that white sphere there, that's the moon area. And the methane collection loops are going to be at the angles of the extreme positions of the moon, which is an 18.6 year cycle. The uh, center point there is, is like a little island with a moat around it, with a bridge over to it, with a sphere on it. Uh, this long ray here that is for the winter solstice sunset actually splits a, a hill in two and the sides of the hill will have gabions holding it up. When you're working with a landfill, you're working with a totally un unstable environment. Uh, it's a living organism 
uh, and it settles at all different rates and uh, it, you have no way of knowing you know what's going to happen with a landfill so you can't build any structures that are going to settle irregularly so everything has to be very simple and uh, like gabions will move with the flow of the settlement um, as will the mounds and the other structures the stairways up the hills are just out of railroad ties and gravel um, it's not just to be seen from the top, of course, it's to be seen from the jets and from, mainly from the roads and the trains. And so the mounds are right on the side of the landfill, creating undulating lines that, that contrast with the, um, the rigid, you know, rigid geometry of the urban uh, industrial landscape. This work is my work for the Santa Monica Beach. And uh, this has been in the works for about three years. And hopefully it'll get built in another year or two. I had to uh, meet a lot of requirements. Uh, it had to be an open structure. It couldn't be too high. Um, and it had to deal with, in some way, with nature. The half circles that you see here are uh, and and those lines emanating from them are at the angles of the sunsets on the uh, equinoxes and the solstices the structure the top structure there is like a sun burst and so no matter what day of the year it is you're going to have cast on the ground um, shadows in the shape of a sunburst the round structure in the middle is where the sun, of course, on the solstice is going to shine down. It's going to sort of form an, an eclipse of that round circle of sun. That is concrete with uh, rubber, very thick rubber matting on top of it. It can be used as like a theater area for impromptu musical events or skits or something and the area in the sand would be a good place for people to sit down watch whatever's happening it also can be used just for sitting so it's uh, meeting a certain social requirements uh, it's uh, has you know a natural element uh, alignment and it's a very open airy structure that uh, is not going to be ponderous on the beach it's, the site for it is right where the Venice Beach and the Santa Monica Beach come together. Here's another view of it. And lastly, this is all I have to show you of a work I'm doing in the New York subway system. I'm working with an architect, Lee Pomeroy, and he's remodernizing the subway system at Fulton Street. Now, Fulton Street is where all the subways come together. And I'm doing a ceiling piece in the corridor that ties all the subways together. And it's uh, steel bars, and the holes are constellations, various stars and constellations. And it's sort of, once again, I'm inverting the world. I'm putting the stars underneath the uh, ground. And I'm taking grating, which you normally walk on, and I'm sticking it up on the ceiling. So, and I'm also, I've also abstracted the 1930s um, fixtures in the subway and uh, used those as my lights coming down uh, through the holes, which will be stacked, circle, cone shaped. And there we are at the beginning again. So that is the end of the uh, slide lecture. Um, are there any questions? Yes.
with sewers. I'm having trouble hearing you. Have I worked with sewers? Uh, just not, I mean, just minimally. Uh, when I did the, the uh, drainage system in Toronto, the catch basin, we had a very bad storm before we finished it, and I realized that uh, the gravel wasn't going to be enough. We hadn't dug down far enough. The earth was still impenetrable, so we had to have uh, a pipe, a runoff pipe, that went into the city sewer system. But you, it's not anything you would see. I haven't done anything with sewers yet. <laughs> but uh, I just want to say one thing in general that um, what I hope is going to happen in the future is that artists and architects are going to collaborate more, that artists can be brought into the situation sooner and uh, have something to say uh, about the totality of how something will look. Um, you know, that there needs to be a breakdown of, of, of the disciplines that have often become very rigid and, and also a softening of egos. Yes? I don't do any of the engineering myself. I, uh, I have an engineer that I work with and I also work with, um, like with my park, there was an engineering firm that was hired to, uh, to do the engineering. And I worked with the landscape architect for Arlington County and he did the plans and put it into the language of landscape architecture and wrote the specs, you know. So it really, none of these uh, works could be done without uh, cooperation from a lot of different people. Yes? Well, uh, the question is, uh, when I was looking for land for sun tunnels, did I have the land in mind? Um, I knew what I didn't want. I didn't want something like Monument Valley, where you already had... Oh, yes, I did know what the sculpture was to be. Yeah. In this, that instance, I knew what sun tunnels was going to be, and I looked for the land. But generally, I'm working the other way around. I go to see a site, and um, it's the site that conjures up the work. I respond to the site in, in all its aspects, including the psychology of the place, you know, the sociology, the topography, um, the built environment, you know, the materials of the place. Uh, also, all of the rules and regulations, uh, the city ordinances and codes, and, and what kind of maintenance will be available once the work is finished, what can I expect? And then I want to know everything because I, you know, I want that all in my head before any idea pops out because that way the idea will be a distillation of everything that I know and all of the parameters of the situation. And in that way, I don't have to ever compromise. Yes? Um, in your work, Hydra, how do you keep those bays in the school of water? Well, that was a very primitive work. I did that in 1974 when I was just, you know, starting uh, thinking in this area. The way that you keep them full is to have a man in a water truck come and fill them up. <laughs> But he came all the time. He had to, other things to fill there, you know? So there was this little man that came around. And the way you empty them is through osmosis, you know, or capillary action, uh, because those pools, there was a drop of 200 feet there into the river. You just had to get a hose and empty it out. Yes? Not having been familiar with your work or the work of others perhaps doing similar or, or urban and rural and wilderness type or sculptures um, I, and I guess pursuant to this other woman's question 
Um, are artists going out and finding sites and finding opportunities, or are these opportunities coming to you via urban planners and developers and whatnot? Um, for, for the most part, people come to me. But uh, often, I also have to uh, help sort of to set up situations. I was just in Santa Barbara last night giving a lecture, and they have a very good public art administrator there, Maria de Herrera, who used to be at the uh, LA County Museum. And in order to uh, get people in Santa Barbara thinking in terms of public art, um, you know, she invited me there to give a talk. And, you know, and I spent quite a bit of time meeting with park directors and, you know, administrators and sort of setting, you know, making the soil fertile. Uh, now, maybe something will come out of that and maybe it won't. Um, but it's part of the process that I am in. Like, I don't feel giving a lecture is something separate from my work. It's what I have to do in order to exist as an, a public artist. I have to uh, get, you know, let people know about my ideas and, um, you know, it's all part of the same thing. But I don't know, mainly people come to me because I, you know, I've done enough work and, uh, but that, each commission is different. Uh, I've never had one that was the same. Sometimes uh, they come through uh, competitions, sometimes I'm selected and, um, which I prefer. I like to be selected and then I'll I can throw myself into the project and then if they don't like my first uh, proposal, which is unusual, but once in a while that happens, I can then come up with a second one, which might be totally, I mean it's usually completely different than the first one. As if I don't want to compromise uh, ever. And then if I felt I couldn't do anything, I would just say I can't, you know, you'll have to find somebody else. Do you believe that there is a strong opportunity for uh, perhaps people in your audience here to uh, locate opportunities to create these type of works? Yes, definitely. Uh, I think it's, it's a very rapidly growing phenomenon, public art. I mean, it's just taking off like Matt. Uh, and a lot of younger uh, artists are having many opportunities. Like in Santa Barbara, the, um, there are like five or six uh, artists there that are having, getting opportunities on the local level. And uh, I know it's true here too. Like there are just three that were selected. The last time I was in town, they, they selected three. So. so it's a, a growing phenomenon, and I think often communities want to get local artists involved. I mean, it's part of the spirit of public art. But on the other hand, you see, if you're not from a place and you come into a place, uh, you can perceive it with a lot of clarity and detachment. And I think that you can perceive the essence of a place more easily coming in from the outside than someone who is immersed in the place. So it should be a combination of the two. And this kind of art also is very decentralized. You know, I, I live in New York. I spend a lot of time around the country. And I'm interacting with artists all over the country. And so that it tends to uh, disperse art. I mean, New York, even though it remains the center in terms of like media, uh, there's certainly there's a, a, a decentralization occurring quickly. Yes. Yes. Some, some things you discover after you build something. Um, and that certainly was uh, one of those things you picked up on that. I, I, you know, how did I know exactly how that was going to look? 
or I wasn't even thinking that much about that effect. But then once it happened, I, I thought that was very interesting. Uh, yes, but I don't. Uh, I don't get too caught up in making very fine models. You know, I I think in three dimensions, so I usually make a very rough model to, to think through my idea, and then I may make a drawing from the rough model, and then uh, and then after that, it's a struggle. Like if I have to present the model, I may balk at at making a really nice, clean model. I mean, I know what the idea is. I know what it's going to look like. And the idea that I have to like make it real you know, nice, uh, I often will hire somebody to do that aspect for me. Yes? Yeah, well, I, I usually uh, call up a astrophysicist, you know, or an astronomer, but, and I work with a surveyor, however, I never trust what they tell me, you know, I just, they give me all these figures, and they say, this is where the sun's going to come up, and I always go out and do one empirical reading, just to check the, the data, and uh, it's always been correct, but <laughs> I just don't trust it. Like with the piece in uh, the annual ring, the big dome-shaped piece, I had art students out there. We each had a stake in our hand, and I had called the uh, astronomer, and he told me at 1.32 and 21 seconds or something, that would be the moment. And so I, had, I went out and bought a beautiful stopwatch, you know, like minus Swiss <laughs> stopwatch. And I was there, and at that moment I said, stake it. And it, it was exactly, it was perfect, yeah. <laughs> yes? Well, the pool is not on an incline. That was, that's the uh, wide-angle lens. <laughs> It's a photographic trick. Um, anyway, I think, uh, are there any more questions? If there are other questions, the reception of her in the end. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. All right.